All right. Man. Some good worship. So that last song, right? Glory to glory to glory, right? That sounds awesome. Why does it hurt so badly? <laughs> right? Isn't that, isn't that the irony of that? Is that we sing this and it's like, yeah, that sounds amazing. And then we live it and we're like, I don't really want to walk that path. <laughs> um, this morning we're going to read a story of a guy named Jephthah. I think that's how you say his name. I don't know. I called him Japheth for the entirety of my life up until I started studying this. So uh, Jephthah is this guy's name. And we're going to be going through Judges chapter 10, 11, and 12. Okay? It's okay. It'll be verse by verse. We'll be out by... Yeah, no. Um, I, I usually joke, and then I end up going long anyway. So we'll, uh, we'll see. But, um, man, this, this guy, <sighs> rough life rough life. And you're like, wow, that's, that, that sounds horrible. <laughs> I would not want that life. I mean, and that's, and that's the reality, right? We, we look at that and we go, if, if God were to present to us our lives, the whole timeline, I think we would all go, man, you know, that, this is great, right? If, if, we, if we trust in Christ, we go, this is great because we know where the end is. And this is why we all watch movies, because generally speaking, I think I've watched like one or two where you're like, wow, I didn't expect it to end that dark. Usually they, they like, it all works out at the end, right? Like whether, I mean, and even a, even a, a, a nonfiction movie, like typically you don't, you don't even, the true stories you don't want unless they like end well. Um, and so if we had this whole timeline before us, I think we'd go, yeah, this is great. The problem is, is that in the midst of this timeline, exactly what Warner was just talking about, there's a lot of these, right? And, and, but, that's, but that's the path, that's the process, that's, that's what God is doing in our lives. And so this morning we're going to be talking about the word sacrifice a lot. And um, Jephthah is going to give a, a huge sacrifice, and uh, we're going to dissect that. And what I want us to do is, so three things. And whenever you're reading scripture and you're, and you're trying to like, and you're trying to get what God had, like, why do we do this? Why do we read this? Why do we spend the time going over it? So there's, there's three things that we have to do. First, we have to figure out historically what actually happened. Like, what, what's, the, what's the actual pieces of information that happened? Second, how does that fit into God's plan? Right? If, if we believe that God is sovereign and that, and that he is providentially in control of all that is happening, we have to read this now factual story and go, how does this fit into God's plan? What, what's the purpose of this? How did he orchestrate this? How, how does God's entire rescue of humanity, how does Jephthah play into that? That's the second question we have to ask. And then the third question is, is why do I care? Like, really, how does this affect my Tuesday? What's the, what's, how do I get this? And so that's, that's our task. And every time we come up here, whether we say it or not, that's what we're doing. We're trying to go like, hey, here's factually what happened. Here's how it fits into God's plan. And then here's, here's why I think you should care. <laughs> and so that's what we're going to be digging into this morning. And I know as we're going through Judges, it's like, man, over and over and over again, we're kind of reading a very similar story of, of somebody coming up, God, God brings somebody up, using them, and then, and then they go to the side. And then he brings somebody up, and then he uses them, and he goes to the side. And so if we, if we, start, if we stop looking at how this applies to us, we're going to miss what he has for us this morning. So, so let's, let's uh, start by prayer. Father, we thank you so much for the privilege to come here to worship you. To worship you in song, to worship you as we, as we pour over your word and, and ask those questions. What do you want us to get out of this? Why did you preserve this for us? And I pray that this morning that you would provide us with that clarity. I pray that you would um, speak this morning into all of our hearts and that you would just reveal yourself to us in a unique way and that you would be glorified. We love you, Father, and we thank you for this time. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. All right, so Judges chapter 10. 
We're just going to start in verse 6, okay? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump through some of these things, and I've, I've picked the, the parts that I think are, are pertinent. And you can go back and read through it, and I'd encourage you to. But in Judges chapter 10, verse 6, it starts off, and it says, The people of Israel did, again, did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Shocker. And serve the Baals and the Ashtaroth, the gods of Syria, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of the Ammonites, and the gods of the Philistines. And they forsook the Lord and did not serve him. Okay, so similar words. We've read this now, I think, eight times, right? Like this, this keeps happening. And it's, and it's ironic, right? Because I, at, at first blush, like we read it, it's like, oh, my goodness. Again? Like, come on, Israel. And then we look at our own lives. We're like, really? Again? Right? I mean, it's, it's, it's more parallel to our lives than we, than we want to give it credit to. So then what happens? Verse 10. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, saying, We have sinned against you because we have forsaken our God and have served the Baals. And then down in verse 16. So they put away the foreign gods from among them and served the Lord. And he became impatient over the misery of Israel. That word impatient can mean discouraged or grieved. Like basically, the Ammonites have, have come in and they've oppressed Israel because they have rebelled against God. And at some point, God goes, all right, I'm done with you, Ammonites. It's time to raise up the next judge. And so we see the cycle continuing. And so here, here's what's interesting. Um, in fact, and th this kind of tells us a little bit that this is a historical book. So uh, I'm not going to go through the verses, but in, in uh, the very beginning, there's a guy named Tola. He's a judge. 23 years. That's all. There's a guy named Jair. He's a judge. 22 years. That's all. Okay, now we're going to get to Jephthah. And then at the end, what we're going to see is he's going to list off like three more judges. And then there was this judge, and then there was this judge. These people, like... There, there was no apparent significance to their judging or no story or no, nothing that God necessarily wanted to communicate to us. He used them, certainly, but Jephthah's story is unique. In fact, it, it covers all of chapter 11 and a good portion of chapter 12. And so, so here's God. He goes, okay, there's this guy, this judge, and then this one, and then, hey, let's talk about this story. And so that's what we're going to do today is we're going to look at this story because God obviously wants us to look at Jephthah and what he did through him. All right, so Judges chapter 11. We're going to go through verses 1 through 11. I'm going to just kind of start and stop. The verses will be on the screen. But let's get us some background of who this Jephthah guy is. It says, now Jephthah, the Gileadite, was a mighty warrior but he was the son of a prostitute. Gilead was the father of Jephthah. All right, so we start off and we go, okay, he's got a sordid past. Not, not his fault. It's just, he just wasn't born into a great lineage, right? Like, his, you know, whatever. <laughs> we'll just keep going. And Gilead's wife also bore him sons. And when his wife's sons grew up, they drove Jephthah out and said to him, You shall not have an inheritance in our father's house, for you are the son of another woman. All right, so you can see the, the, the battle here, right? The, the half-brothers or whatever, right? Like, you're, you're not the, the son of our father and our mother. You're the son of our father and some other lady, so we don't want you to be here. And notice what it says in verse 1. He was a mighty warrior. So... Reading between the lines here, I think what we're seeing is that you, you've got all these brothers that are going, we're going to lose <laughs> because this guy's a mighty warrior. We would rather him just be kicked out, like just, just leave. And so they do. They force him out. It says, then Jephthah fled from his brothers and lived in the land of Tob, and worthless fellows collected around Jephthah and went out with him. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that last line. I, I don't really know what that means, honestly. It's hard, right? Like, did Jephthah invite them? Like, is he hanging out with bad friends? Like, we all tell our kids, like, you, you know, you're going to be like who you hang out with. Was Jephthah a worth, worthless fellow? Or was it just that these people collected around him because he was a mighty warrior? Right? And so they're like, I'll, I'll be with this dude. 
We, we really don't know. But what we see is that God is going to use Jephthah. And we're going to spend a bunch of time talking about Jephthah. And so who is this guy? Son of a prostitute. He's kicked out. He's rejected by his family. That's a great start to a life, right? I mean, he's in this other land going, what is my life going to be? Maybe, maybe you're there now. Maybe you're like, man, I, I don't know. This isn't what I thought was going to happen. Probably when he was on the playground when he was six years old, he wasn't thinking he was going to get kicked out of the town. But nonetheless, here he is. And in verse 4, it says, After a time, the Ammonites made war against Israel. And when the Ammonites made war against Israel, the elders of Gilead went to bring Jephthah from the land of Tob. So, so now, and this is probably why he was a good warrior, they're like, hey, um, so here's the thing. We need somebody to, to defeat these people. And so they go, and they go pull Jephthah back from this land. They're like, yeah, I know we kicked you out a few years ago. We were just joking. We actually want you to be a part of us and save us, right? It says, and they say to Jephthah, come and be our leader that we may fight against the Ammonites. But Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, did you not hate me and drive me out of my father's house? Why have you come to me now when you are in distress? And the elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, that is why we have turned to you now. They don't even answer the question. It's pretty interesting. They're like, that's why we turn to you, that you may go with us and fight against the Ammonites and be our head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, if you bring me home again to fight against the Ammonites and the Lord gives them over to me, I will be your head. And so, so what does he do? He, he, he's like, this is an opportunity. He's like, I'm going to be brought back into the fold. I'm no longer the black sheep. I get brought back in. This is great. This, this might have been something that Jephthah had been dreaming about and praying about and going, man, wouldn't it be great if I could go back to my homeland? We don't, we don't know, but I would presume that those would be his thoughts. And it says in verse 10, And the elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, The Lord will be witness between us if you do not do as you say. The, so Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead, and the people made him head and leader over them. And Jephthah spoke all his words before the Lord at Mizpah. And so, so here's, here's the outset, right? So Jephthah, he's brought back. You're going to be the judge. You're going to be the one that's going to rescue us from the Ammonites. So then what does he do? So here's what Jephthah does. He goes, and he goes to the Ammonites, and he, and he basically pleads the case for Israel. He, he goes full politics, right? Like he's not, he doesn't go with a sword right away. He goes and just tries to rationalize with them. And he says in verse 12, Then Jephthah sent messengers to the king of Ammonites and said, Why? What do you have against me that you have come to fight against my land? And the king of the Ammonites answered the messengers of Jephthah, Because Israel, on coming up from Egypt, took away my land from the Arnon to the Jabok and to the Jordan. Now, therefore, restore it peaceably. And so he goes on. And... If you want to go back, you can write in your Bibles, it's Numbers chapter 21, and it, it is. I mean, like, Israel's like, hey, can we, can we just travel through your land? And they're like, no. <laughs> and they're like, okay, we'll go around. And then they, like, attack them. And so really, like, there's, there's actually a little bit of innocence here on Israel's part. And Jephthah's, like, really pleading the case for Israel, going, hey, I don't, I don't want war. Like, let's settle this peaceably. Well, it doesn't happen. And so then we get to verse 29. Chapter 11, verse 29 says, Then the Spirit of the Lord was upon Jephthah, and he passed through Gilead and Manasseh, and passed on to Mizpah of Gilead, and from Mizpah of Gilead he passed on to the Ammonites. And he goes, and he's going to go defeat them. And this is, this is, so the Spirit of the Lord comes on Jephthah, and he's like, All right, it's game time, I'm my warrior. I, I, I didn't think that this is where my life was going to be, be, but here we go, right? And then look at what it says in verse uh, 30 and 31. So here's Jephthah. He's on his way out, and it says, And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord. You ready for this? And said, If you will give the Ammonites into my hand, then whatever comes out from the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the Ammonites shall be the Lord's, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. 
we'll get into this, and I'll, I'll give a little, it ends up being his daughter. So now he's like, oh, I didn't really expect that. But, but right here, at this point in time, the spirit of the Lord is upon Jephthah. And he goes out and he goes, and he makes a vow to God. I will tell you, scholars are split <laughs> on what this, was this vow? Was this an if-then statement? Was Jephthah saying, God, if you do this, then I will do this. Or if I do this, then you will do this. Like, is he trying to bind God into a contract? Or is he just promising to God? Like, like genuinely saying, in faith, I'm going to offer a sacrifice. Like, like this is all part of it. And, and I want to show my faithfulness to you and offer a sacrifice. So that's, that's, the, that's the debate. So in normal fashion, what do we do? We let Scripture interpret Scripture. That's the easiest way to do it instead of conjecture right so hebrews chapter 11 verse 32 and what more shall i say this is we just went through hebrews right and the author of hebrews is listing off all these people of faith all these these people who messed up definitely but still had faith and it says and what more shall i say for time would fail me to tell of gideon barak samson jephthah David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. And so, so when I read that, I go, man, I, I, don't, I don't think Jephthah, I, I don't think that was a bad vow. I think that I think he's he's in faith saying, "Man, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to offer you a sacrifice uh, when I come back," and uh, and I, and I don't think he expected that to be his daughter. <laughs> just to be really clear, I think he was expecting to give a sacrifice, but I think he was expecting the sacrifice to be something that was, you know, reasonable, something that he could kind of give a, as a thank you to God, like, "Hey, you know, thanks thanks for working all this out." Thanks for rescuing me, for bringing me back. And so what, is, what does God do? He answers it. He, he allows Jephthah to, to kill the Ammonites. And in verse 34, it says, Then Jephthah came to his home at Mizpah, and behold, his daughter came out to meet him with tambourines and with dances. She's celebrating because he won. This is great. They get to go home. Like, this was, this was a great high, Right? We were just talking about this. Great high. Everything is right in the world. Son of a prostitute. Doesn't matter anymore. Kicked out of the land. Doesn't matter anymore. He has been effectively redeemed and brought back into Israel. He's won. All is great. And then it says, She was his only child. Besides her, he had neither son nor daughter. And as soon as he saw her, he tore his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, you have brought me very low, and you have become the cause of great trouble to me. For I have opened my mouth to the Lord, and I cannot take back my vow. So here's here's Jephthah going, I was good with sacrificing to God. I was good with whatever the exchange was that God was going to require of me. Like he was going to give me this, bring me back into the land. He was going to give me leadership over the people, like everything that I wanted. What was the cost? He goes, whatever comes out of my house, cheers, God. It's totally worth it. And then his daughter came out. Now, here's the thing, and this, is, this goes back a little bit, and you can write Leviticus chapter 27, you can go back and look. We'll go back to Old Testament sacrifices a little bit because here's, here's the debate. Did he sacrifice his daughter? Was this a human sacrifice? The answer is no, it wasn't. If, if an unclean animal had come out of his house, guess what he can't do with that unclean animal? Can't be sacrificed by Leviticus 27. Like, like that was not an option. So what they did is they actually brought these unclean animals before the priest and they would say, hey, it's worth, I don't, and I'm totally going to make up this number, 20 shekels or whatever, right? 
and they go, oh, it's 20 shekels, and you had to pay 120% of it. And so you, you exchange the, the value of this animal that you couldn't sacrifice on the altar because it was unclean for money, and they had to pay, pay instead. So presumably, <laughs> Jephthah isn't like, well, honey, hop up on the altar. I know God <laughs> forbids human sacrifice, and he's not keen on us murdering people. Right? Like, th th that's not what transpired. What he did is his daughter went into temple service. Like, she became, the fa you've probably heard, and we'll talk about it with Samson, right? But a, a Nazarite. Like, she became effectively uh, in service, uh, celibate service to God. And you can see this as we read um, in verse uh, 36. It says, in, uh, and she said to him, my father, you have opened your mouth to the Lord. Do to me according to what has gone out of your mouth, now that the Lord has avenged you on your enemies, on the Ammonites. So she said to her father, let this thing be done for me. Leave me alone two months that I may go up and down on the mountains and weep for my virginity, I and my companions. So he said, go. Then he sent her away for two months and she departed, she and her companions and wept for her virginity on the mountains. And at the end of two months, she returned to her father, who did with her according to his vow that he had made. So what's the emphasis there? It's talking about her never being with a man, right? And in fact, if you look at verse 40, actually at the end of verse 39 there, it says that she had never known a man. And it became a custom in Israel that the daughters of Israel went out year by year to lament the daughter of Jephthah, the Gileadite, four days in the year. And so what's the emphasis? She went to serve in the temple. Okay, so, so there's the facts. That, that's what happened in the story. So how, what, what, <laughs> what do we do with that? Right? I don't think any of us have ever made a vow that sounds or looks anything similar to that. But I think the attitude or, or the, the idea and the struggle that Jephthah had was probably real, right? When he comes back and he goes from this high place to this very low, he goes, man, that, honey, that's not what I wanted to have come out of my house. That's not, I, I was willing to sacrifice something for God, but I, I kind of was hoping it was a little bit smaller. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> Isn't that kind of how we operate? Like, I'm, I'm willing to give God, like, anything and everything. It's just not, I mean, not everything. And not that thing, or that one, or that. Don't touch that. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's how we live, right? And what does God do? God goes, he calls his bluff. <laughs> He's like, how about the thing that you want most? Here's why. What, what did his daughter, and it was very clear, it says, She's his only child. There's an emphasis here. He's not going to have any kids. No more lineage. His line ends. That was a really big deal. There was not going to be a son or a grandson or the, the, whatever the last name of Jephthah was. There's not going to be any lineage of that. It's gonna, he's going to be cut off. And his daughter also. Who, oh, by the way, arguably has a little bit more faith than I would argue Jephthah does. Because she's like, whatever you said, Dad, <laughs> I'm game. If you said that to God, whatever you need to do. She didn't even make the vow. But she also, she's like, cut off. That was a big, big deal, especially to somebody who came from the son of a prostitute and got kicked out of the land and got rejected by his people, right? Like this idea of, of a heritage, especially as the king and like leader, not king, but judge, right? And being the leader going, I want my lineage to continue. Like, like this is a good thing. And you go, well, God, I thought that's what you were giving me. You were bringing me back in the land so I could be ruler. And then I had my daughter and we were going to, I thought that's what this deal was. And God goes, no, no, never, never said that. You actually are the one that made the vow. And so, and so what do we see here? Like we see this, this sacrifice is huge, huge. Don't worry, girls. 
not planning on making a vow like that. We laugh. But, I mean, that's, that's a real question. What, what does God ask us to sacrifice and why? What was the point of Jephthah's sacrifice? What did he do? He, he ends up securing peace for six years. Then he dies. <laughs> that's quite the life. This little shimmering time of, of fame. I mean... <laughs> Like, six hours? <laughs> I don't know how long it lasted. But, like, he went from, like, I won, I defeated my enemies, I'm going home, and now it's all lost. Why? Why would God do something like that to Jephthah? Go to Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Paul writes, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. What does God ask of us? Living sacrifices. There's nothing off the table for us. Our lives, our spiritual worship, our, our real worship. If, if God is this God, our worship is that I was created for his purpose and his purpose alone. Not for my purpose, but for his purpose. And so all these things that surround me, that I accumulate, that I put on my back, that I carry around the world with me, aren't necessarily for his purpose. So why does he do it? Why does God want us to be a living sacrifice? Here's, here's the, the incredible part of this, right? And we see this throughout Judges. They're not good enough. Their sacrifice wasn't good enough. Jephthah and his daughter, great. And it even says that like the girls went up and they would mourn four days out of every year for Jephthah's daughter. That's good. They remembered because Why? Because what they sacrificed effectively kind of saved them from the Ammonites, right? Like if you were a third party to this thing, they'd go, wow, that's unfortunate for you guys. But I'm glad you rescued us from the Ammonites. But it wasn't enough. They didn't really fully get rescued. Israel hasn't been rescued yet from all of these judges. They, God raises up somebody, and they work for a time, and then they're out. And then they raises up somebody else, they work for a time, and they're out. In this case, Jephthah presents a sacrifice, a legit sacrifice to end his lineage, sacrifices his child. Does this sound familiar? What is he doing? God is pointing to Christ. He's pointing to Jesus, and he's going, do you understand that like, this is not going to end until a child is killed for you? Like, there is a more complete sacrifice. There is no amount of sacrifice that we can do. You could sacrifice every possession you have, and it's not going to earn you salvation. Let's get that, right? Like, we could sacrifice our entire families, and we can be super, like, monks on hills and, like, not, not do anything and n not eat and, you know what I mean? And it doesn't matter. That's not why God is asking us to do this. He's, he's asking for our hearts. He's asking for us to be worshipful, to recognize him for who he is. And here's, and here's the great irony of this thing. If you look at Judges chapter 12. So here, all of this happens. And then Judges chapter 12. It says, the men of Ephraim were called to arms and they crossed to Zaphon and said to Jephthah, why did you cross over to fight against the Ammonites and did not call us to go with you? We will burn your house over you with fire. Oh my goodness. Jephthah's like, gee, really? <laughs> like, if my sacrifice wasn't enough, now people are angry at me because I didn't call them to join with, with me. And in fact, the Ephraimites... They actually did this in Judges chapter 8, verse 1. They did the exact same thing. They were just spiteful, hateful people. 
They were never content. And so here's what Jephthah gets. He gives a sacrifice for all of these people, for all of Israel, overthrows the Ammonites, sacrifices his lineage, sacrifices his daughter. And then they're like, hey, you could have done that a better way. So not only does God call us to sacrifice, sometimes the critique in the sacrifice is challenging too. Oftentimes it's more challenging than the sacrifice itself. Because we, we want affirmation. <laughs> we, want, we want people to acknowledge what we gave up, right? Jephthah probably would have been great if people were like, man, thanks for giving up your lineage. Every day, just come to me and tell me. Remind me of the sacrifice that I gave because that will help me deal with it. Isn't that kind of how we, how we operate too, right? And so, and so what do they do? They, they go, no, actually, we're mad at you and we're going to burn your house down on you. So how, do we, so, so how do we apply this, right? So we see this story, right? That we're like, man, this is a sordid story. Challenging. But we see that God is slowly moving, and we're going to see this develop in these next few chapters, is that God is continuing to point towards Christ. He's continuing to use the judges and bring them up and show the, the inadequacy of humanity. That like there is nobody here that is going to be able to solve your eternal predicament. There's nobody that's going to solve your heart problem minus Jesus Christ. Right? It's the Holy Spirit that, that changes our affections, our hearts. It's, it's the sacrifice of Jesus, his blood that was poured out on our behalf that secures our salvation. His sacrifice, not our sacrifices. So then, why do we have to sacrifice? <laughs> right? If, if it's Jesus' sacrifice... <laughs> Can I just get like the quick line and, and I will take not the glory to glory to glory thing and we'll, I'll just ride this and I'll just get the one glory and I'll have this life a little bit easier. I mean, I'm not the only one that's thinking this, right? Come on. <laughs> because that's where I struggle. So there's three reasons. One, and I've kind of already alluded to this, it points to our insufficiency. When we live as living sacrifices, it points to the fact that in Jephthah's life and his daughter's life, like it points to the fact that, like, man, we need a sacrifice. The entire Old Testament, by the way, right? All the sacrifices, all of that was pointing to Christ, pointing to the inadequacy. It doesn't matter how much blood is spilt if it's not God that's doing that on our behalf. I mean, all religions have some sort of sacrifice, right? It's, it's people trying to earn their way to God. Like, and if, if I just give you this thing, will you love me more, God? What if I give you this? Will you forgive me then, God? What if I do this? Will you, will you like me? That's what religion is. And that's why Christianity is completely different. That's why the sacrifice of Jesus was God coming to us and giving a sacrifice on our behalf. Like, we didn't even do it. He did it for us. Like, that's why sacrifice is the, the going uh, word as we think about Christianity. And that's why Paul calls us to live as living sacrifice, to point to Christ. There's a second reason. It redirects our contentment. Man, we, we like things and people I just shared this with the men's group uh, a couple weeks ago. Man, like that is, I, I can say contentment in Christ. I can say those words. But I don't know if I really believe that I, that, that I feel those words. I want to feel those words. I do, which is the only thing that gives me confidence to know that, <laughs> that I'm saved. Because I'm like, I really want to feel that. But honestly, I'm content because of a lot of other reasons. And maybe that's the same for you, or, or maybe you're discontent, right? But in either way, what sacrifice does is it points to our contentment is in Christ. It's not in these, these things that we're carrying in this life with us. Going, well, I'm happy because I got this house. I'm happy because I got this job. I'm happy because I got this relationship. I'm happy because people like me. I'm happy because of these things. No. No, our contentment ought to be in Christ, and so what does God do? And that's the, the path of glory to glory to glory. You see, as we shed these things, what happens? 
As we get rid of these things, we realize that actually they were giving us this false contentment. A contentment that didn't last. Or maybe we don't, maybe we don't voluntarily get rid of them. Maybe, maybe God takes them from us. And we go, why would you do this? Why would you take that from me? And he goes, I'm still here. Aren't, aren't I enough? You see, that's, that's, the real, that's the real hurt, right? That's the real pain that we feel. See, the reality is, is we all sacrifice. I mean, I, I can stand up here and we talk about sacrifice, and you're like, man, I, I don't want really to sacrifice anything. But you do. You sacrifice. We all sacrifice. The question is, what do you sacrifice for? I, I just, I left for a week, and I went down uh, to Miami for my work. I sacrificed my family for a week, right? I, that, I mean, that's a sacrifice. You know, it, we don't often question each other when we sacrifice for our work, do we? It's just, it's work. Let, let me, I'll just, I'll be really honest with you guys. You know how many times people ask me, or are concerned about me burning out because of my service to the church. You know, nobody's asked me if I'm going to get burnt out serving in the Air Force. Why? Why? Well, because one, you get money. Right? One is a job. And, like, we don't question each other's work. Like, it's work. Like, you have to work. Right? Or you have to have some sort of income, and so we let people live, and, and we don't question that. Have you ever asked somebody, man, I feel like you're going to burn out in your work? I mean, maybe, occasionally, but it has to get really rough. You see, it's okay for us to sacrifice for the things that the world sacrifices for. It's okay to sacrifice for toys, new cars, bigger house. It's okay to sacrifice for those things. The world sacrifices for those things. Am I right? Like, we all sacrifice for these things. But then when we go and we look at church, we're like, yeah, I don't want to sacrifice for that. Don't sacrifice too much. Be careful. Why? What's the difference? I don't know. I, I'm telling you, I struggle with these things. But the reality is, is that we all sacrifice. And God is taking us from glory to glory to glory by he refining us and, and pointing us to where we can really find peace and contentment. And you know where that's at? It's at the foot of the cross. It's the exclusive pay, place of peace and contentment. And yet we think that we can find it in all of these other places. And last, it glorifies God. When we live lives of living sacrifice, people are going to ask you, why in the world are you doing that? Why? That makes no sense. Why would you ever do that? And you have to give an answer. Because, because I love my God. Why do you do that? Because I love whatever. Fill in, fill in the blank, right? You see, our lives are, ought to be living sacrifices. Why? Because that's, that's the good news. That, that's the opportunity for us to say, man, my life is not worth anything. I can say what Paul says, right? Like, whether I have a lot or I have nothing, man, I, my contentment is in Christ. Like I said, I want to believe that. I want to say that. I want to really feel that. But I struggle with that. And I think all of us do. And the reality is, is that the more often we're talking about this, the more often we're living lives of sacrifice, the more often we're pointing to Christ and we're going, no, that's the sacrifice that matters. I'm not doing this to earn God's favor. I'm doing this because I love him, because he loves me, because he is faithful. I'm not trying to work my way up. I just love God, right? That's what we want to say. That's how we want to live. And so when we look back at the story of Jephthah and we go, man, God asked a lot of him. A lot. You guys, tomorrow could be it. Could be the, um, could be our last day, right? 
We don't know. Judges chapter 12, verse 7. Jephthah judged Israel six years. Then Jephthah the Gilead, Gileadite died and was buried in his city in Gilead. Okay, next judge. Why, would God, why does God, is he just toying with us? See, if we're not careful, that's what we start to think. We're like, man, this doesn't sound a lot like a lot of fun. But see, the reality, though, is that we are put here to glorify God. That's why we were created. And if we have the opportunity to glorify God for two months, for one day, what a blessing that is. And some of you maybe are like, I, I, I highly suspect that, or I highly doubt that. <laughs> like, that doesn't sound good. What did, what did I mean, Jephthah, you know, his, his daughter saw his faith, and she had faith. And these girls that went up and, and thought about this and mourned for her thought about that sacrifice. There's, there's an impression that we live. You know, like, it's not about building stuff. It's not about things. It's about relationships. And, and it's about being able to love others well and to point to Christ. And if God gives us one day on this earth to be able to do that, that's a blessing. And if he gives us an opportunity to sacrifice and to find contentment in him, God, I want that more than anything. I don't want the sacrifice, but I want the contentment. Let me pray.